The BBOC class, uh, at the end of the middle of the period, I said at the end of the period, erase your work, but if there are any problems that you would like me to address via video, put the numbers on the board and I'll do so. So I've got about, I don't know, seven or eight problems here that B block requested. And um, A block on Monday, feel free to do the same thing. So what we'll do is homework, take the sheet back with you, copy your answers or take a picture at the end of the class of your answer key so you know you've got correct answers. See if you remember how to do it at night or in case of the weekend, most people do their work on Sunday night. That's fine, you take a break. But then you come back to it because you're trying to get a working knowledge. A working knowledge means that 20 years from now, somebody asked me to write the equation of the line, I can just do it. That's working knowledge. I, I don't say, oh, I haven't done that in 20 years. Let me, you know, we'll see what happens in 20 years. I'm retiring. Yeah, so, you know, probably be, well, we won't go there. Anyway, uh, so I'm just going to talk about those problems and um, see if we can uh, make some gains. I'll layer it with some discussion as well. I think the camera is positioned well. So I had asked a question number four about triangle A, B, C. And if we didn't have this discussion in class, capital letters stand for angles. And the way you draw the triangle, we'll draw it in standard position. We'll connect our angle to the origin because sometimes we're going to be drawing triangles in different quadrants. But right now, just kept the values positive. And so positive X's and Y's or A's and B's and C's, whatever, first quadrant. So I think I asked for the tangent of angle A. If I had asked for the tangent of angle B, because I don't want to have to erase twice, then I would have put B as my angle at the origin. And then that would be little b. There's my right angle. C is always going to be the hypotenuse. And then by process of elimination, that would be letter A, little letters, side lengths. Uh, good, I have an eraser. Not a good one, but I have an eraser. But I didn't ask for tangent of B. I asked for the tangent of A. So therefore, I am going to draw angle A. And I don't care if it's drawn to scale or not. I'm just going to do little a, big A. Little a is opposite big A. There's my 90, hypotenuse C, and there's B. And what we've kind of done is standardize the drawing. So if we all have the same drawing, it's going to be much quicker to analyze. And I think I gave you A is 3 and C is 4. And what I've been pushing in class is Pythagoras. So if that's 4, that's 16. If that's 3, that's 9. That means that has to be 7. If this area gets bigger, this one's got to get smaller. All right, so I can erase those and I can say, okay, that's square root of seven. So what's the tangent of angle A? That's three, we don't care about that. Tangent is opposite over hypotenuse. So the tangent of this angle is three over seven, three over root seven, okay? Now, if I wanted to know what the angle is, I'd have to do the inverse tan Right? Haven't we been talking about what that means? Inverse. So that's the notation we use. And I would have put this in a calculator and probably would have set it to, to degree mode and just typed it in Google. I think Google would take this and give you a choice of degree or radian. And I think this has got a better feeling if we talk about degree measurement. I think you can see all of that. All right, so I hope that helps somebody. Now, algebra really has evolved from the relationships in a rectangle. A lot of it has. And a rectangle has length and width. And I can't tell you what the size of that length and width is. The only time I can tell you what the actual values of length and width is, is when the area is zero. Because I know the product length times width equals zero. Has to mean that one of the dimensions, for instance, the height, I could have put height instead of, could have put height times width. If I get rid of the height, notice how the height's getting smaller. What's happening to the area of that rectangle? It's gone. There is none. So I could have talked about another dimension, length times width times height. Then I could have talked about the volume of a box. 
And I hope you realize that by getting rid of one of the dimensions, like squashing a box, boom, volume is gone. So it's very helpful sometimes when we write calculations in terms of products, because a product can always be set to zero. And then we have immediate understanding. Your product was 2x squared. That's one of the dimensions of the box. 5x minus 2. We can think of that as a dimension. And we can think of 4x plus 7. Okay, if I had not written 4x plus 7, I would have had a rectangle. Okay, and those sides are not even. So what comes out of that historically? Something called completing the square, where we shorten the longer side, we lengthen the shorter side, and then we get a perfect square, which means we can use an inverse operation, plus minus square rooting, right? So I hope you get a sense of the history of the development of the, the thought processes. In fact, I just put something out there completing the cube because this is a cubic, it's got three dimensions. Actually, it's a quartic, it's got two, three, four, it's got four dimensions, which means one of the dimensions, I don't even know what to call, because I don't know how to draw a fourth dimension, but I certainly can play with it algebraically. So what would it be nice to have a product equal? Zero. So the last thing you wanna do is rewrite this as ax to the fourth plus bx cubed plus cx squared plus dx, plus E equals zero. That's the last thing you want to do. My God, it just got a whole lot more complicated. And I know how to write that in graphing form, but even that doesn't help. What helps? Writing these in terms of products. So if this is our length, this is our width, and this is our height, what number gets rid of the length? And I hope you would say x equals zero. What number gets rid of the width? Well, we want 5x minus 2 to have no magnitude. Looks like two operations here. Positive 2, 2 fifths. So if I put 2 fifths in here, the 5's canceled, the 2 minus 2 becomes 0. And if I put a 0 here, I, you know, I don't have to put 2 fifths in here. 0 times anything, whatever those lengths are, doesn't matter. No width, no volume. So maybe you can look at that one now and just say, okay, what could X equal here? Negative seven fourths. You know, what are we going to do with this? Well, later on, we're eventually going to talk about when is it greater than zero? And graphing these is very helpful in, for a calculus class. So this is five X minus two. So I know that if I create zeros, I've created roots at negative seven four, I've created a root at two fifths, and I've created a root at zero. And if I put a million in here, it comes out as a positive. Uh, you know, I know this thing. Uh, well, I should find the y-intercept, negative 14. So it looks like this thing has a y-intercept of negative 14. Did I do that right? Zero, if I put, no, it's zero. That is the y-intercept, excuse me. Zero times anything is zero. So this graph looks something like that, if I put it in Desmos, that's going to be very helpful in future discussions. So let me give you another one right now and see if you can tell me what values for x will produce zero, 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 and zero. So I'll give you four dimensions. And they'll all be linear dimensions, which means there's a sign change. So let's do uh, 5x minus 9 times 3x plus 7 uh, times uh, 20x minus 99 times uh, x minus 5. Let's just do that one equals 0. Okay, somebody's struggling. All right, so what makes this, this long polynomial equals 0? You use this number. I think you substitute that number into that sentence. It's coming out of zero. I think if you use this number, 
product is going to be zero. I think if you use that number, product's going to be zero. Certainly, if you use that number, it's easiest to see. And that's that concept. So what does that tell you? That tells you that if you have a problem, and this was on your worksheet, I think, maybe, I don't know, I think it was something like 20x squared equals 4x, something like that. Well, that's a polynomial. If I move it to one side and make this right side zero, then that tells me if I can write this as a product, I should be able to see my answers. All right, so I can take out a 4x times uh, 5x minus 1. I can see my answers, 0 and 1 fifth. Obviously, that's a skill you want. Okay, and we first introduced that in Algebra 1. All right, so you should have been working with it since Algebra 1, Algebra 2. Maybe you didn't slow your brain down enough to know what's going on. All right, hopefully, you are giving it your full attention now. That's what you do. It's a skill and it's very helpful. And if you know it, you can get quick answers. So try to look for that as you go through the rest of the semester. Wasn't there for a lot of folks on the first test. A lot of folks multiplied this out. God, lost valuable time. So I think you got to know that. So I'm going to keep asking it until everybody knows it. And when a lot of people don't know it, it'll be on every worksheet. And when Good part of the class knows it, well, then it's going to be not on as often because we got to look at more new material. Okay, so then the next problem was, well, you know, the next problem is basically the same way of solving it. It's a product. I gave you three times the sine of x, that's an angle, minus six times two cosine x, that's an angle minus one equals zero. And what we have been developing here is the following in a unit circle. In a unit circle, let's take a 30 degree angle. We draw the triangle. We say that this is one half and we got it by doing the sine of 30 degrees. We drew the picture, it's a good picture, we see a half. Well, what if it wasn't 30 degrees? What if it was 31 degrees? Well, it's not a half anymore. And I don't know the ratios in a 31 degree triangle, I gotta go to the computer to find those ratios. So let's say it's a generic X. And I guess the height is the sine function. Those are the Y values. The heights. So I just said height. Couldn't I use the letter H to represent the sine function? And if I did the letter H, then I'd have 3H minus 6 times, I guess, cosine is the width, 2W minus 1. And that's what I do in my head, having done this for more years than you. My brain goes to heights. And so now I'm looking at the heights, the heights based on an angle. The heights based on an angle could be two to one. I think about that for a second. I go, you know, the heights in a triangle, in a unicircle, excuse me, never get bigger than one. So if I see a number bigger than one, I go, you can't do that. You can't do that one. Don't, don't want to ask me that. Width, oh, I guess the width could equal a half. Oh, that one. And I want the width to be created by an angle. The width created by an angle. So I guess I got to draw a circle. Looks like I got to draw a circle. Now what I'm realizing, this is why repetition is my friend, that after I do this one, I probably should do another problem right here on the video and give you a whack at it. All right, so I'm gonna start that right now because uh, that's what my instructor's brain is saying to do. All right, so what angle does it take? Well, the first angle is zero degrees. 
Zero degrees, I think, gives me a width of one. That's a place on the cosine curve. Zero gets me one. Mm -hmm. And then I go 30 degrees up. Well, that's root three over two. That's 0 0.87. 0 0.87 is just a little bit less than one. Then I go up to 45 degrees. Well, that's not root three and two, that's root two over two. That's 0 0.71. Ah, yeah, it's that one right there, 60 degrees. You know, 60 degrees gives me an F. And some of you started drawing over here for the next one, but that's minus one half. And we said, no, you don't want that one. But you know, I'm starting to get, I think I'm starting to get the first period of the cosine function. Sure looks like that happens. You know, and we talked about pi over two, there is no width at pi over two, 90 degrees. 90 degrees has no width in the drawing. Oh, that's, you know what, there's another dot. Oh, yes. Are you going to have to learn what one period of the sine and one period of the cosine is? Yeah. And most of the kids coming into calculus, I had like 50 kids. Ah, six of them. Six out of 50 could draw one period of the cosine curve. I hope you all can draw one period. By May 16th, I'm putting my money on you. All right, so what were the two drawings that your brain is trying to get enough experience with? I think that angle and that angle. And this is not 90 degrees here, it's less than 90. And I hope you recognize 60 degrees and I hope you're working with radians enough to know that that's 180 divided by three. So 160 degrees, two, three, four, five chunks of 60. Right, because this is 360, I'm subtracting 60, that's 300 degrees in degree symbols, radians, it's five pi over three. I'm still not convinced that folks know what that is in terms of how you measure that. So I'll do that real quick. So five pi over three is pretty darn close to the number five. And five times 3.14 divided by three. That's pretty close to one, a little bit bigger. So I'm a little bit more than five, a little bit more than five what? Well, let's get a really good drawing here. Oh boy, this is tucked under my, let's see if I can get it out here. Come on, baby. Where are you? I got a hold of it. There it is. All right, so let's draw a little circle here. It's actually fairly little. Oh, the board's moving on me. The board's moving on me, look at that. All right, uh, I'll go free hand. Okay, that actually looks like a pretty good. That's a little off center, but it's okay. So that has a radius length of one holding of the lanyard strings here. That looks like one radius length. So I'm going to start measuring from here. So I think that's one radian. Oh, I lost my radius. I think that's two. I think that that is three. I think that was 3.14. I think this is four. I think this is five. I think that is six. I think that is 6.28 radius lengths, which is once around the circle, which means I can convert, I can convert, I can convert any degree into radians. Let's convert 60 degrees into radians. Oh, degrees into degrees, they cancel. And 60 goes into 180, ah, three times. I wonder where we use that concept, where we multiply something to turn something into something else. Hmm, I'm gonna keep an eye out for that. Yep, so your answers were pi over three, then five pi over three. So once again, one period of the cosine function, where do I equal a half? Right there, that's turning out to 60 degrees. Right, and that's 90, not the best drawing. And then it happens again over here at 300 degrees. All right, so I'm gonna keep putting those in front of you until the lights go on for you. And they won't go on unless you give it a little thought. Doesn't mean you have to get it today, but if you do that four days in a row, I'll put my money on you. All right, let's see now. Oh, I was gonna give you another one. Okay, so let's look at uh, two sine x, plus root three equals zero. 
You pause the video, I'm just gonna do it. 2H plus root three equals zero is what my brain does first. H equals negative root three over two. My brain just went to negative 0.87. I go to the circle. I know that's a height of zero. That's a height of negative one. I think I'm there and there. I already did that one a little while ago. Five pi over three. So I guess this is four pi over three. Play that a little slower. I think this one here, we did a little bit of call. That is this triangle. That's 60 degree reference angle. That's 360. I guess I came back three to 300 degrees. 300 degrees times pi over 180 degrees. Sure looks like 30 degrees. The degree symbols cancel. I could divide that by 60 and that would become a five. And I could divide that by 60. That would become a three. And if you think I'm talking too slowly, speed up the video a little bit. And right, there we go. So that took care of this one. That took care of this one and this one. Now we want to do the cosine of pi over two. Yeah, which we've already been talking about. Pi over two is 180 degrees. There's my drawing. It's got height. Height's one. Hypotenuse is one with the zero. Can't really draw it. But I can tell you what the cosine of zero is. I mean, the cosine of 90 degrees, which is pi over two, zero. And once again, we look at the cosine curve, and there's 90 degrees. Yeah, that's zero. All right, you need the x equals nine four. So this is a nice one that's gonna lead into some nice discussion. So let's see if I can do it some justice. I better start high here. Can you see that? Yes. I'm looking for the value of an exponent, base e, that gives me nine fourths. Is this written in terms of base e? I don't think so. Is there a way we can make it written in terms of base e? Yes. And it looks like I have a division problem. Hmm. In base e notation, I think nine is three squared and four is two squared. Now I can put it in base e. Three is hmm, e to the 1.1. That's to the two. Two is e to the 0.7, and that's squared. Am I starting to get some activity here? Yes, and it should be Chris Ramirez should have written about it. Right? Don't you have activities this weekend, I hope? Well, you tell him to put this one on the weekend scoop. Is that what it is? You tell him to put that on the weekend scoop. He forgot to list that activity. I think the activity here is e to the 2 times 1.1. Hmm. And I think the activity here is e to the 2 times 0.7. Now, what are we going to do with these exponents? I think we're going to subtract them. Yeah, we could subtract them, right? We're just looking at 2.2 minus 1.4. So I guess my answer for x is 0.8. So over here, I would, my final answer would be x equals 0.8, not e to the 0.8. I'm just looking for the exponents. There's the activity. Now, this is kind of interesting. I got a subtraction. Why do I have a subtraction? Because I have a division problem. And logarithms only look at the exponential activity. So really, the exponential activity is two times that minus two times that. And logarithms were very helpful. I think I told you this the other day. Napier, 1619. I think it took him 20 years to write the tables. Exponents, what do you put on top of a 10 to get a 31.93? 20 years, but he figured it out. And uh, when you're studying stars, for instance, you know, how far is it from here to the nearest star? I think a lot of miles. I don't want to, I don't think we want to work with those zeros. And, you know, 93 billion. No, that's 
93 million is the sun. I don't know what the nearest star is, but exponential functions, very helpful. You know, scientific notation, 10 to the sixth over 10 to the five, working with the exponents and then putting them back in on top of 10 at the end saves a lot of work. So we're gonna just look at the exponential activity here. And I think there's another name for 1.1. I think that's the ln of three. I think that's two times the ln of three. Again, I'm getting an entry level discussion. You had the whole last year to learn the rules of logs. I never learned them in high school. You probably didn't either. This takes lengthy discussion, just like something else that you're doing that maybe you finally learned how to do in the last couple of weeks. So this is an entry level discussion that we will continue to have until this happens for you. Lights off. Lights on. Hey, remind me to tell you the story about lights off, lights on. It's kind of funny. Do you anticipate what's going to be here? Two. LN of two. Yeah. Now, where did this come from? This came from squaring the number three. We started there. Where did this come from? This came from squaring the number four. So this has nothing to do with that exponent, right? The exponential activity is here. Keep that in mind, all right? It's very big difference from squaring that number and just squaring the two. What is this? The ln of nine. This is the ln of four. Those numbers you get off a calculator, we are approximating them just so we get a feel for what's going on. So you would do this to get your answer and it would be darn close to 0.8. I'm gonna guess 0.79, I'm gonna guess 0.7996 on a calculator. That's close enough. And why is there a subtraction there? Because it was a division problem, right? When you do a division, you get the same base, you get some subtraction of exponents. All right, so that was not something I expected you to, to grasp at an instant, but you're never going to grasp it just until we start with some entry-level questions. And I will do a much simpler one than this when we want to address that. What I was hoping you would get out of this is understanding if you wanted to get some answer base E, then you got to convert the numbers into base E. That's what I was hoping for today. All right. So now we only have three more problems. And then I will upload this. And hopefully it helps the people who requested that I do these problems. All right. So now we're graphing the sine function. Now, anytime you want to graph a function and you don't know what it looks like, you got to collect data. All right, that should have been an Algebra 1 experience big time. All right, and then as you put dots on the board, and I'll put some dots on the board. That was my nose, that's my eyes, right? Eventually, that was a terrible example of putting dots on the board and coming up with a picture. <laughs> that was awful. But eventually you get to see something, a pattern. What would have been an easier one? Maybe something like this. Oh, I see the triangle. I got a circle here. Do you know what the height is at that place on the circle? I think 
starting at the circumference zero, I guess I get zero. How about that place on the circle, 30 degrees, which is pi over six, by the way. Do we know what that height is? Oh, I forgot to start to put my data. Oh, zero, zero is the origin. Pi over six. Oh, you know what? I think that's a half. Let's put a dot at a half. We'll call that one. We'll call that 30 degrees. We'll do it in degrees. I'm halfway up, 45. You know, I think that height just got a little bigger. I recognize 0.71. I recognize 45 degrees as root two over two, which is approximately 0.71. I don't think you've worked with that enough to have necessarily figured that one out, but I hope you know what pi over three is. I hope you know what 60 degrees is. I hope you say root three over two. And I hope you're starting, to, I know a lot of people know what that is, 0 0.87. 0 0.87 is bigger than 0 0.71. So, oh, 0 0.71 was the 45. 0 0.87 is the, is the um, 60 degrees. So 30, 60, looks like 90. Real important, 90 degrees. Oh, the height's one. I'm starting to put some dots on the board. Do you think you can continue with the rest of it? That's one period of the sine function. Because when I get back all the way around, I think I'm back to a height of zero at two pi. No height. I guess at pi, no height. Oh yeah, over here, no height to that. So that's what you got to do. Every time you solve an equation, there's a place on the board. I think we did the, didn't we do the uh, sine or something? Maybe we didn't do the sine. Like we did the cosine, I think, earlier. Okay, so that's what you're trying to put in your brain. One period of the sine function, because if all of a sudden I doubled it, then I wouldn't have gone up to one, I would have gone up to two. And we call that an amplifier. Right? You like to hear me play the guitar, right? Nice folk song, you know. Uh, what the hell did we sing in the 60s? Michael Rowe, the border shore. But I want to amplify it. So I plug it into this electric machine. I don't do that because I don't hand technology well. And then I go, my old Sorry, I did that to you. Okay, so amplification. We're going to play with this a lot. We're going to even shift, you know, so it doesn't start at zero anymore. It starts over here at two. And we're going to play with this thing. So we got to get familiar with one period first. Now I could wait. You know, nobody else is talking about trig right now. I can wait. I can start talking to you after midterm, begin these discussions, but I think it's better if we do it now. All right, 30, 60, 90 triangles. That's problem, I don't know, number 26, I guess. I think that's where I'm at, 26. So what do we know about a 30, 60, 90? Let's draw one. Pictures are very helpful. I think I better go smaller here because I'm going to make these much bigger. So 30 degrees. That's a 30 degree angle right there. Okay. I think that gives us a half. I think it gives us root three over two. Do you mind if I write root three over two as one half times root three? One half. Now we'll leave it as root three over two. And one. I'm going to double the size of that. That looks like it's about twice. That looks about twice. That looks like it's about twice. If I double it, I think that's a two. I think that's a one. I think that's a root three. I think that's still 30 degrees. Let's multiply that by 10. That's too big. How about we multiply it by five? The angle is still 30 degrees. Well, that's 10. That's five root three, and that's five. Oh, that's half of that. Jeez, is there a pattern here? Well, let's see, this seems like it's twice the size of that. This seems like it's twice the size of that. I guess this is twice the size of that. This looks like this should be doubled to get that. This should be doubled to get that. This should be doubled to get that. Geez, I think that if I give you some new number here, like, like 60, I hope you could tell me what that is. I hope you'd say 30. That would be nice. 
And if I gave you 40 here, well, I hope you'd say that that's 80. Sure looks like hypotenuse and smaller side come to you in a two to one ratio or a one to two ratio. Okay, that takes care of that one. Well, let's multiply this by five again. That's 10, that's five, that's five root three. Geez, let's say I don't give you that. I give you the smallest side. I wonder if you can figure out how to get to that. Oh, it sure looks like you multiply by root three. And it's helpful if you know what root three is. It's 1.73-ish. Well, that's smaller than two. So if I multiply this by two, I get 10. If I multiply this by root three, it should be smaller than five times two, right? That's smaller than that. So I guess this is very similar to five times 1.73. And I guess this is five times two. So I guess root three connects these and a factor of two connects those. Now, if I want to get bigger, I multiply the smaller by two. If I want to get smaller, I divide the big one by two. Same thing over here. If I want to get bigger, I multiply by root three. If I want to get smaller, I divide by root three. So let's do a generic one. And this is for your SATs and also understanding that the size of the triangle doesn't matter. So let's call this X. Can you tell me what those are? Pause the video and try. I hope you took X and multiplied it by 1.73. It gets bigger. I hope you took X and you doubled it. I might not give you the smallest side. I might give you the middle side. Can you give me the other two? I hope. To get smaller, you would have divided by root three. And once you get that one, I guess over here, you would double it. Nobody ever asked you to go from this side to that side, but now that I see it, whatever this number is, I guess I double it and divide by root three. I didn't know that until just now, 45 years. I probably did that once or twice before, but never found it really helpful. So it's not in my memory banks. Okay. So I guess we're down to one last problem. How do we sketch? Well, I know it's that. I know I want the y-intercept because I'm crossing the y-axis. And I know I want the uh, vertex. And then I'll show you how I do it later. But let's just get this now. So minus b over 2a, minus 20 over minus 4 is 5. If I plug 5 in, that's 100. Cut it in half, 50 minus 1 is 49. I know my y-intercept is 0, and it's smaller, 0, smaller than 5, so it's on the left. And if I put a 0 in, I can see I get minus 1. You did what I asked you. Now, if I want to put it in graphing form, I just use the multiplier and the vertex. And I know I've asked you to multiply that out. If you multiply it out, you're gonna get this, which means it's the same calculation. Okay, getting tired. So I'm actually gonna just show you what I do for a quick graph. I did ask you for the roots though. So I know that to get from 49, uh, cup shape down, yes, negative one. I know those are my roots, one, Negative one's a little bit smaller than zero. So I got a very small number here, close to x equals zero as one root, which means that I'm just a little bit smaller than 10 on this side. So I know this is near 10. I know this is near zero. Okay, what do I have to do? I gotta get down 49. But I'm multiplying by negative two, so I gotta divide by negative two. And I know that I'm centering this at five. So I got a five plus minus, and I know the inverse of square and square rooting. So 49 divided by two is pretty darn close to 25. And the square root of 25 is pretty darn close to five. And five plus five is 10, and five minus five 
is zero, that number throws it off just a little bit. And now, why do I know that? Because basically when you put it in graphing form, you can see what I just talked about. What's the first step here? Going down 49, boom. What's the next thing you do? Divide by negative two and negative into negative. Down 49, divide by the multiplier. Boom, that's gone. That's done. What are you doing when you solve squaring? Square rooting. And then minus five becomes positive five. That's helpful to think about that. Right, now I'm gonna go back and just show you what I do now. Uh, Cause I always like to find the shortest and easiest way to do something. Cause I've had to do 150,000 of these. Now, and if I'm correcting things on a test, Man, my brain gets tired doing so much math, but I learned a lot of math from the reps, I gotta tell you that. So I like to draw the y-axis and I like to look at this backwards and I like to see negative one. And I know I'm on the upside of a downward shaped graph. So that takes care of that. And I know it's a downward shaped graph. Okay, so I know that's what my graph looks like, which means my X is positive. If it's positive, I don't have to worry about the signs. I just have to divide two into 20, which is 10 and cut it in half. And then I just put five into 20 and I cut that in half to get the 49. But just to show folks who haven't done it as much, five squared is 25 times two is 50. 50 minus 100 minus one. I hope you can see that when you do that, you can either take the opposite of the 50 make it minus 50 or cut minus 100 in half, minus 50, minus one. I just, what did I just, oh, that was vertex. Uh, I just screwed up, my fault. Positive five times 20, see, I knew I made a mistake. It's nice to do it because I didn't get that. That's positive 100, so my brain was getting tired. And, um, oh, I erased the problem. That's what I did, I erased the damn problem. So this is minus 50. Right, and now, now we can take the shortcut. I hope you can see that that's 50. So you could have either changed the sign or cut that in half as a shortcut to get there. And if that makes sense to you, the reason you can do it, I'm done talking, I'm tired. All right, so that's a lot of math and I wanna go eat some lunch before the big crowd gets there. All right, so I will upload this some point here soon. In fact, I'll start it now.